Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, the remote uh, is not connecting, um, so my dad, the, the remote's not going to say. Well, have you ever seen or committed a serious party foul? Um, is this right? Yeah. Um, something like, you know, a party foul is something like spilling your drink on an innocent party goer, maybe dancing on the furniture, or yell talking the whole party long at a more posh dinner party, bringing up politics or religion or criticizing the host decor or food would constitute a party foul. People have parties often to celebrate and have fun, and, and anything that's too serious or angry or critical will probably dampen the mood and seriously go against the grain. While Jesus didn't commit any sins, and the scriptures say no deceit was found in his mouth, Jesus definitely did commit some party fouls in the course of of his ministry. Now, Jesus wasn't a stick in the mud, and rather than spilling people's cups, he filled them up to overflowing at weddings and feasts. In fact, the Pharisees accused him of partying with the wrong crowd and hanging out with gluttons and sinners. People wanted Jesus to come to their shindigs, weddings, and dinner parties. In uh, Luke chapter 14, Jesus was invited to the house of a leading Pharisee on a Sabbath day meal. However, their motives were probably not entirely innocent. They were, I'm sure, on the surface polite, perhaps with painted on smiles and overly gregarious handshakes, or I don't know, maybe the Pharisees gave bro hugs. But at this party, Jesus tells the Pharisees, tells us the Pharisees were looking to trap Jesus. They didn't leave disappointed. A man with a deformity was present. It could have been that he was just there, or it could have been that he was planted. Whatever it was, Jesus took it as an opportunity to heal and to teach. He asked the guests, as the man becomes, uh, as people see the man, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Well, Jesus' question killed the party vibe because an awkward silence followed. But it was probably more than simply guests being uncomfortable. They knew Jesus had a reputation, they knew Jesus' reputation, and some of the Pharisees hoped he would say something about the Sabbath day so they could bring him up on heresy or blasphemy charges, or at least undermine him in some way. Now, this led to an interesting dinner party conversation, uh, a dinner party conversation about dinner parties eventually. Well, after healing the man, Jesus sent the man off and then turned to the guests asking, which of you have a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out. Well, the Pharisees refused refuse to reciprocate Jesus' straightforward communication. Once again, they don't answer Jesus, even though, I mean, think about it, Jesus has come onto their turf and engaged them on their own terms, and he's taken the bait. Only this time, Luke informs us that it was not because they were trying to trap Jesus, <laughs> They could not give Jesus an answer even if they had wanted to because, of course, they would take care of their own property or their own children. But they had totally lost track of the fact that this man was a member of Abraham's family, who they claimed to be. So why would they refuse to help a member of their own family? Can anyone say awkward? Jesus had brought up religion, he'd insulted the guests, and worst of all, he healed on the Sabbath day. He'd committed some serious and several party fouls, and he wasn't even done yet. Of course, 
Uh, party fouls are nothing new for Yahweh. Noah's 100 years of ark construction, not to mention the flood itself, was probably a real buzzkill to the rather debaucherous pre-Diluvian world. Samson not only committed a party foul in the Philistine temple to Dagon, his party crashing brought the Dagon house down, literally. And at the Babylonian party of Belshazzar, God was acting kind of like an unsupervised and out-of-controlled toddler, drawing on the walls. The difference was a toddler does it when no one is there to see him do it, but Yahweh did it when everyone was there to see him but not see him do it. A disembodied hand wrote on the wall, and it was some pretty heavy stuff. Jesus wasn't done yet, though. Instead of excusing himself from the party at this point, which I'm sure the grimacing host and other guests, at least some of them, were hoping for, Jesus instead offers some party advice of his own. Now, I'm not sure that anyone thought Jesus was qualified to be offering to be a party referee at this point, but it turns out this time Jesus is the one pour, uh, throwing party foul flags. Uh, he starts with some wedding reception advice. Now, most people want the best spots to sit down at. If there's a sign seating at a wedding reception, the most important guests sit with the bride and the groom and family and other important guests sit close to the wedding couples. If you aren't at the front, one of the front tables you, and you have a choice to sit anywhere else, you'd probably look for one of the most desirable tables, or at least you'd look for a table to avoid that one uncle. But Jesus gives us practical advice that you should sit yourself towards the back so that instead of being embarrassed by being told to move back, you are honored by being invited up front. Jesus sounds a lot like the Proverbs we had as our Old Testament reading. It's good advice, but it's, it's the kind of advice that if you stop and think about it and consider, you're like, yeah, he, he really is right. But usually you don't want to stop and think about it, and it's more difficult, takes more self-restraint to do, even if it makes sense. Approaching life with humility leads to more good surprises instead of bad surprises. But really, more importantly, regardless of what the world does, those who try to exalt themselves are humbled by the Lord. And those who approach not only God, but life in general with humility will be exalted by the Lord. But after this, Jesus reverts to form and starts instructing us to com commit our own egregious party fouls. I mean, his advice about throwing a party is, shall I say, edgy? When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also, in return, invite you in return and you be prepaid, repaid. I mean, that pretty much sums up how we all <laughs> invite uh, people to parties and how societies have always thrown parties. I bet you mostly invite your friends, family, and the people that are going to fit in well with your friends and family if you can help it. But Jesus says, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. I mean, this is just a different way of partying. It's a partying that is not interested in us having the best time possible or hobnobbing with the rich and elite, nor is it about raising money. It's not interested in building up your list of potential climate clients or making professional connections. Jesus suggests giving parties specifically geared not to gain you any advantage in this world. Well, grace seriously needs to have some more parties like this. Now, I think, I, I gotta say, I think we've tried to do some things like this, uh, but now that COVID is more manageable, I, I think we need to have some parties for the blind or the lame, or, or maybe we could come up with some other ideas, uh, you know, just off a simple one, like a party for special Olympic athletes, or a Christmas party at a local nursing home with a, a small budget. I'm sure we could come up with better ideas than that, and I'm open to them. Uh, but those are the kinds uh, of parties that we should seriously consider throwing. At least one. Uh, 
Christians are not called to be fuddy-duddies who can't have any fun, right? We're not, Jesus calls us, but Jesus calls us to party it up for a different reason than the world. And Jesus encourages parties, but we're also encouraged multiple times, we're not to lose our minds or our self-control when we party. I think that uh, betrays um, that we have you know, that we, we don't, we have nothing better to live for. And so our lives, you know, they stink. And so we need to escape. Now, we certainly do need healthy and fun ways to relax. And, uh, but we also need to learn or be reminded that we have something worth celebrating. Uh, because we don't need to get smashed because life sucks. No, we have things to celebrate. I think celebration parties are the best kind of parties. You see, what I mean is when the main goal is not to get something out of others, but simply to celebrate something that's already been accomplished, people can relax. You can enjoy it. When you're, when you're uh, inviting others to celebrate good news with you and not expecting a lot, those are the best kinds of parties. You don't have to accomplish anything. You're just there to celebrate. Well, we have victory in Christ our Lord. And he has accomplished it all. So we don't have to, we can't do anything. But instead, we can simply celebrate. Instead of worrying about contacts, climbing the social ladder, or getting something out of others. Um, Jesus uh, crashed death's party as well. In the Apostles' Creed, we say he descended into hell. Um, why? Well, Jesus went into hell, remember, a place for imprisonment and separation. And after his death on the cross, First Peter tells us that God's plan of um, salvation had worked and Jesus announced that he had won the victory. Hell is no longer necessary, no longer a part of our future. It's simply a vanquished foe. Well, Jesus crashes this world's party as well. He says, he comes to say, wake up, sleeper, arise from death. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're no longer doomed to darkness and despair, for I'm lighting the place up. I've broken your chains, and I'm going to keep breaking them. I don't party in the exact same way the world does, partying in futility with reckless despair and ending up worse than you started. No. No. I've come to bring you something to celebrate. This party is not for insiders. It's for anyone and everyone who is humble and willing to repent and wants to celebrate with Christ and in the joy of the gospel. And so we do party as Christians. We celebrate life. We celebrate reconciliation, a world at peace in Christ. And so... It's time to break out the planning, party planning committee, and celebrate in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.